Okay. Hello. How are you guys doing? I hope you're doing okay. We're starting our third week of this course. Um, so hopefully you've looked at the Rococo um, lecture and notes. And um, if you haven't read the Enlightenment notes yet, the Enlightenment and Natural Art notes uh, yet prior to viewing this, you might want to read those because there's kind of a lot of information um, for the Enlightenment that's not necessarily visual information. So you might want to check that out first. Okay, so let's get into it. The Enlightenment and Natural Art. Um, Okay, so last time in the Rococo, we talked a lot about how this aristocratic leisure class is sort of the dominant thing at the time, and, and that's uh, the dominant subject matter of the artists of the time. Um, that's kind of what's culturally going on. In the 18th century, that's not the only thing happening. It's not just about garden parties and super rich people in velvet and silk swinging on swings and lush landscapes. Um, that, that kind of ideal didn't go unchallenged. So one of the other big things that's happening in the 18th century is what we call the Enlightenment. This is very impactful, not just in the arts, but in society and culture in general um, throughout Europe and, um, and America, actually, after the 18th century. So I just want to go into some of the people that are important really quick, and, and this will explain how we get into the natural art that we're going to look at and the, the work that kind of highlights some of the aspects of the Industrial Revolution. Um, okay, so we have all these social hierarchies that kind of determine the class system and in Europe, um, a lot of nobility, a lot of monarchy, this kind of thing. And we've seen, um, even throughout the Renaissance and the Baroque, the emergence of this middle class, right? Um, so these social hierarchies begin to dissolve Revolutions erupt at the end of the 18th century. The American Revolution, as you know, uh, 1776, right? The French Revolution, uh, these both happen at this time. A major influence during this time um, that leads to some of this revolution and kind of shakes up the idea of society is the Enlightenment. So again, check out my notes for more detailed information about this. Um, but essentially the Enlightenment scholars um, turn to this idea of empirical observation and, um, and scientific experimentation as, as kind of the bases to acquire knowledge, okay? So instead of just kind of blind faith, we have this idea that we should start acquiring knowledge by doing some testing and experimentation and by observing the natural world directly. Um, I do want to note, and I go into this a little more in my, my notes, that about hundred years prior in Ethiopia, there's an Ethiopian um, intellectual named Zara uh, Jacob who has basically all of the ideas of the great Enlightenment thinkers a hundred years before they do and publishes them in, in a work. Um, and it, it, he's seldom taught when we think about um, this train of thought. Generally, we think of these white Western European dudes as being the inventors of all these um, kind of mind-blowing revolutionary ideas. So I just like to throw in there that um, actually an Ethiopian man had all these thoughts a hundred years prior. So it's worth looking into. And then of course, you know, in Europe, more contemporary to Zara Jacob, we have like Descartes and people like that. But let's uh, not get Descartes before the horse. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a terrible joke. And talk about these Enlightenment guys. Okay, so one of them you've probably all heard of is Isaac Newton. Um, so we talk about empirical studies. Isaac Newton is the guy for that, right? He's a scientist, um, and he does these empirical studies to confirm his theories about the natural world. He's the guy that Apple hit him in the head and he thought of gravity, that guy, right? Okay, um, alongside him, his contemporary is John Locke, um, and John Locke also believes in these ideas of empirical studies and he translates this into social issues. So he writes the doctrine of empiricism, which basically says that knowledge comes from sensory perception. So things that we can perceive in the real world, in the natural world with our senses. Um, he believed that the laws of nature also grant humans rights, specifically the right to life, liberty, and property. That sounds kind of familiar to us as Americans, right? Life, liberty, and property, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The kind of basis of our government, that is no accident. John Locke was 
unbelievably instrumental and influential in the, the thoughts of our founding fathers in America. So he's kind of a, he's an important guy to, to know about if you're interested in the history of um, modern democracy. Okay, another guy pictured here is um, uh, Diderot. So Denis uh, Diderot, he is important, um, especially to, to trivia nerds like me, because he's the guy who edits the first encyclopedia. So he has this idea that while all these, these thoughts about how empirical evidence and knowledge um, are the things that make society better, he says we need to make this accessible to people, okay? So he gathers all of these important studies and articles in different, um, all different subject matters of the time and gathers them all together and makes a 45 volume encyclopedia. And he's the first guy to think to do that. And what that does is it democratizes knowledge. What do I mean by that? I mean, he makes this knowledge accessible to everyone. So if you can go to the library or, or are um, lucky enough to be able to purchase an encyclopedia, you can gain all this knowledge. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be an aristocrat with a fancy tutor. You can actually just read all the, the pertinent knowledge of the time um, in these encyclopedias. So that was a very revolutionary idea. So that's why I include him here. He's, he's kind of an important dude. Um, he's also an art critic. He's the leading art critic of the time. Voltaire, if you think of one guy as being sort of the spirit of or being synonymous with the Enlightenment, if you're playing trivia some, at a pub somewhere and there's a question about who was the big voice in, of influence in the Enlightenment, the answer is Voltaire, <laughs> almost always. Um, so he's, um, he kind of paves the way to revolution. He's very critical of the noble class, of nobility in general, um, and he brings all these ideas that are coming up from Newton and Locke, he brings all these ideas to France and to the French people and is extremely influential at the time. I love in every portrait of him, I have one of his portraits here um, on the left, he has this like sort of, um, I guess it's kind of a smirk, it's like this sort of little like, he just has a look on his face that looks like he might be a little bit mischievous or something, I don't know, it also always looks like he has lip gloss on, which is, you know, fine. Uh, Okay, other people at the time, so um, Mary uh, Wollstonecraft, Olympe de Gauges, Catherine Macaulay are all um, women scholars of the time, and all of them write um, and are very widely published and quite popular, and they all write about the importance of all this education um, and the democratizing of education, and specifically the education of women. So they write about how important it is if we believe in these ideals and uh, empirical evidence and observations to educate the populace, but not just part of the populace, also the other 50% of the populace, women. So they're important thinkers of the time as well. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, enlightenment, um, during this time of the enlightenment, there's all this investment in education, as I've said, in scientific discovery, and in also in um, kind of technological invention and exploration. Um, so this leads to the Industrial Revolution. Um, the shift in focus to the observation of the natural world also sparks an interest in natural art. So we, we see that these two things are quite um, influential in the art of the 18th century outside of the Rococo. Okay, I think this painter is just sort of delightful. Um, so before we get into the natural art movement and, and what I mean by that, let's look at some art that was directly kind of made in homage um, and, and in honor of the, the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. Um, so this is Joseph Wright of Derby, um, and his work really celebrates ideas of experimentation and ideas of observation and the Enlightenment in general and the, the uh, advances of the Industrial Revolution also. He was kind of like a big fanboy of the sciences who was um, a visual artist. So um, what's happening here? We have, the title is, A Philosopher Giving a Lecture on an Orrery. If you've never heard of an orrery, that's okay. It's a very annoying word to say. It sounds like you're stuttering. Um, so an orrery is this really cool thing. Um, it always makes me think, I don't know if anyone's seen The Dark Crystal. I know they made a new sort of series of it, but if you've seen the classical Dark Crystal, there's that thing hanging from the ceiling that moves all the planets and shows their alignment. 
that's kind of a, the um, fantastical version of an orrery. So what it is, is it's a mechanical model um, of the solar system. So there's all these orbs that are on these um, paths, right, these orbital paths. So it shows each planet's orbital path as it revolves around the sun. And then the sun is represented by a lamp that lights everything from, um, from the middle of it. And the paths of the planets move in a correct uh, relative velocity. So they're moving at the same sort of relative pace to each other when you're looking at this thing as they do in the sky. So it's pretty awesome. And it was um, a, a, an invention at the time that was, was kind of um, fascinating, right, to the public. Um, so one of the things that I love about Joseph Wright of Derby is all of his paintings from this time are kind of like this. They all show a different thing that's highlighting um, an invention or someone lecturing or doing a demonstration about new knowledge. And the thing that I like so much is not that the invention, like the orrery itself, isn't exactly the focus. More the focus is the people, like look at these kids and their faces and this fascination with science. So he really wanted to depict how cool everything was at this time, how, how neat all the new knowledge that the Enlightenment brought was. And I think that's pretty rad. I don't know. Uh, okay, so in this painting, we can see that the lamp, which is the sun inside the orrery, is the light source. So all the light is coming from below and from the central part of the painting. So we get this very intense highlighted shadow, which is reminiscent of some of the figures we've already learned about, specifically from the Baroque, right? Um, like Caravaggio, um, Artemisia Genelleschi. So we know that he is familiar with these artists and is using this technique um, which was used in the Baroque to show high drama, right? We've talked about that quite a lot. So he's showing kind of the high drama of what he considers these really cool technological and scientific advances of the time by using these technical um, tricks that he's learned as a painter, which is pretty neat. Uh, so he brings the drama of the Baroque into the Enlightenment to talk about science. Okay. Um, if any of you, I know some of you have had Art History 1, so you may remember how um, material uh, invention and development revolutionizes art and architecture. Um, particularly, I'm thinking about concrete with the Romans. The Romans invent concrete and it totally changes the way that they're able to build. It gives them the ability to make barrel vaults and groin vaults and um, arches and aqueducts and all these new technological developments. Well, in the Industrial Revolution, leading into the Industrial Revolution, the concrete level invention of the time is the use of iron and then eventually the use of steel. So for this architectural feat, um, I wanted to take a look at this bridge. So this bridge is made of cast iron. Um, if you're familiar, cast iron fences are still kind of a thing. A lot of um, kind of retro patio furniture is cast iron. Um, so it's the f this is the first bridge made out of cast iron. It's the first of its kind. It's built over the uh, Severn River, which is in England. It's uh, near the town of Colbrookdale, England, to be specific. Um, the people credited with creating this are Abraham Darby III and Thomas Pritchard. Um, Abraham Darby is a guy who has a cast iron business in Colebrookdale, and his family has been working in this business for quite some time. So he has a very vested interest in finding new uses for cast iron and new ways to develop them along with the um, Enlightenment, the new information and developing Industrial Revolution. Um, so he has this idea about making something large scale like a bridge. So he finds an architect, this local architect, uh, Thomas Pritchard, to team up with him to come up with this design. And we can tell by looking at this that they are definitely looking at Roman aqueducts. They're kind of thinking of those classical kind of designs utilizing the arch. Um, and so this foreshadows in the 19th century the stylistic choices of exposing uh, these skeletal structures made in steel and in iron 
of later buildings and, and later building projects that come. So this is the first one to use this as a material. So it's important in its material foresight and revolution. It's also stylistically important because this is the first time we see this exposed skeletal structure in kind of an aesthetic light, right? Okay, now let's move on to talk about natural art. Uh, okay. So we talked a little bit about Voltaire. If you look at the notes, you learn more about Voltaire. Um, basically, he believed that the salvation of humanity depended on the scientific advancement and the improvements to society that could be made through that kind of advancement. There's another big um, French thinker of the time who does not agree with this. So in contrast, we have uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You um, may, if you think back, you may have studied Rousseau in relation to Locke. You tend to think about them in relation to each other. For our purposes, I want to compare him to uh, Voltaire for a minute. So uh, Rousseau is a key figure of the French Enlightenment. He's very important at the time. Um, he did not agree with Voltaire. He believed that society and its related studies, like the um, arts and culture developed by society, were actually what had ruined mankind. So he did not think that this was a way to make things better. He thought this was bad. He, he said that the only hope was a return to the innocence, ignorance, and happiness of man's original state. So ignorance of, is bliss. It's kind of a literal um, philosophy of Rousseau. Um, basically, he thought that mankind's emotions and sensibilities should be valued before their reason, which is the opposite of most of the thinkers of the Enlightenment. He said, we have feelings before we have ideas. And he said that man by nature is good. He is perverted by society. So he's kind of this conflicting set of thoughts um, to most of his peers at the time. And he's, he's quite influential um, to, to artists, particularly this artist that we're going to look at. His views are very popular, he's widely read, and he helps inspire the natural art movement, which in part is um, inspired by the, the Enlightenment as a whole because of ideas of observing the natural world and empirical evidence and that kind of thing. But it's also definitely this idea of returning to nature and, and simplicity um, and that kind of thing that comes from Rousseau that, that's also very influential here. Okay, so this artist is uh, Jean-Baptiste Simeon Chardin. He um, is born in 1699 and he lives for quite a long time. I think he lives to the late, um, he doesn't quite make it to the 1800s. I think he lives to like 1780-ish. So he's, he's around for quite a while. Um, and he painted these quiet, indoor, domestic kind of scenes. We looked at another artist who's famous for these kind of scenes um, from the Northern Baroque period. That would be Vermeer, right? Um, but if you remember from Vermeer's paintings, he's painting very um, wealthy uh, people in Northern Europe in their domestic settings. And then there's some kind of moral character kind of um, lesson in them. Uh, Chardin is a little simpler than that. First of all, he creates these works to be a direct contrast to the Rococo. He really like denounced the Rococo and did not think that celebrating this leisure class was a good idea. He didn't think it was good for society. He didn't think it was a worthy subject matter of the arts. He was much more interested in portraying um, good people at home, particularly women and children, and he liked scenes that had this sort of humble kind of innocence to them. And that's what he's really known for. I'm sorry, my neighbor mows her lawn every day and she is mowing it again. So sorry if you can hear the lawnmower. She's retired and mowing her lawn is her great joy in life. Uh, okay, anyway, um, so it's a little bit reminiscent of Vermeer, but we have more of the ordinary people we believe he believes in the goodness of the ordinary, especially women and children. So when we look at his composition, we don't see that super dramatic contrast of light and dark that we're used to from, from the Baroque, right? We have a much softer kind of hushed light. We have this sort of muted warm palette of color, right? It's very sort of um, kind of mellow and warm. Um, we also have these great attention to detail in the still life component. So he thought portraying the setting with a lot of care in these 
sort of um, normal, ordinary kind of scenes was really important. So he definitely paid a lot of uh, attention to that. He is sometimes called the poet of the commonplace and the master of nuance, which I think is a great little uh, review of Chardin. Um, so his paintings have this feeling that is a little bit, um, not quite nostalgic, kind of sentimental. They have like a sentimental feeling to them, right? So we can see where he's getting this idea of innocence as being something that's uh, valuable and important to portray. Um, he was very popular in diverse crowds. Um, he was popular with the middle class and the general populace who were who tended to be a subject matter. He was also sort of surprisingly very popular with uh, Louis the Fifteenth. So this is the successor to the Sun King, right? Um, and he, Louis the Fifteenth, actually bought this painting. He owned this painting for a while. He was also very popular with uh, Diderot who I was just talking about, the guy who, who edited the first encyclopedia and was a big art critic of the time. And because Diderot was such a fan of Chardin, he was able to really promote him because he's someone who writes about art at the time and is an art critic. So he becomes very popular. Um, and so this work that is the antithesis to the Rococo becomes quite popular in the art world in Paris. So that inspires other works. Um, so portraiture as an art form flourishes at this time in the natural art um, vibe, impulse, kind of movement of the 18th century. Um, and in France, we get these portraits that are more, they're kind of more personal and they aren't so fussy and pretentious, right? So um, we talked about this a little bit when I was talking about the Baroque in uh, Northern Europe but there's this sort of history that goes along with portraiture where you have certain poses, right? You have these very fixed kind of poses and you have all your finery on and you have certain objects in the background that show that you are high class and noble and important. And everything just looks very like kind of corseted, like kind of contrived and, and, and um, posed and not very natural, right? So at this time during this natural art, um, movement that's happening, uh, the style that's happening in the 18th century, we see things that look a little uh, less persnickety, right? They look more natural. Okay, so for example, uh, we have Elizabeth Louise Viglet Lebrun. Um, she, all of her work is a very good example of this style. So she, um, let's see, she's born in 1755 and she lives till the eight, late 40s, early 50s. She lives, she lives very long. Um, so let's look first at her self-portrait. I have two of her paintings here. So let's look at the self-portrait. So she's gazing right at us, right? She's looking right at the viewer. She has this kind of little smile on her face, like she's just paused in the middle of her painting. Um, it has kind of a natural feeling. It feels a little like easy, kind of lighthearted. Um, and it doesn't really feel that contrived, posed, kind of awkward, like holding yourself in a very um, particular purposeful way. It does seem much more natural. She looks self-confident. She looks at ease, right, in her environment as a painter. If you look at who she's painting in her self-portrait, she's doing a portrait of Marie Antoinette. You've probably heard of Marie Antoinette, Let Them Eat Cake. That's her, she's the queen. She eventually gets beheaded, okay. Uh, so Marie Antoinette um, was one of um, Viglet Lebrun's patrons, and she painted um, over 30 portraits of her. She painted a lot of portraits for Marie Antoinette and her family. Um, she began painting very young. Her father was um, also a successful portrait painter. I'm blanking on his name right now. His last, his last name was... Uh, Vajib, obviously. Uh, anyway, so he teaches her and she gets so good so quickly that by the time she's 15, she, she starts landing her own commissions. People start coming to her and asking her to do their portraits. Um, she then marries a prominent art dealer, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lebrun, and through his uh, connections in the, the art world, she's able to connect with more patrons and wealthier patrons and people like Marie Antoinette. 
Um, the queen becomes a very valuable patron of hers and helps her gain entrance to the Royal Academy in 1783. She's one of the earlier women to gain entrance to the Academy. She's 28 at the time. After the French Revolution, she gets kicked out because sadly, after the revolution, the Academy no longer accepts women, which seems kind of strange. You would think the revolution would make people more progressive and it does in a lot of ways, but not in that particular one. Anyway, um, so let's look at, at this. We have these kind of more relaxed styles. We can see in her portrait, if we look over at her portrait of Marie Antoinette, for a portrait of a royal, this has such a like glimpse in the life kind of vibe, right? She doesn't look totally stuffy. She's wearing her crazy hat and has her hair all teased up and is wearing her very luxurious gown, but her children are kind of hanging on her and they're just kind of in a room. They're not perfectly orchestrated. There isn't a horse, <laughs> you know? It's just kind of a much more like glimpse into the life kind of vibe and it seems much less stiff than portraits of the Baroque and the Renaissance. Uh, okay, so uh, she's not the only woman to gain admittance to the Royal Academy at this time. Her peer, although this person was, I think, five or six years older than her, um, Adelaide Labille Guiard is also a member. Let's look at her. So this is another, one of the most prominent portrait artists of the 18th century, Adelaide Labille we are. This is her self-portrait, um, and she paints herself very differently than uh, Viglet Lebrun, right? So we see Viglet Lebrun paints herself in the midst of, of a painting, working on a commission for her most famous, most wealthy client, uh, Marie Antoinette. So she portrays herself as this very um, prestigious woman, very confident painter with this prestigious client. Uh, when we look at La B. Uh, Guillard's painting, she um, focuses on her role as a teacher. So this is her with two of her pupils. She taught students out of her, her studio. She would teach up to 10 students at a time in her studio. And she was a very early feminist. So she um, really believed in um, Mary Rolstonecraft and her peers of the time and their idea that educating women was extremely important. So though she's one of the more successful portrait artists in her own right, just as a painter, not as a woman painter, but as anybody painting at the time, um, in her, her kind of business side of her practice, she also educated people and, and exclusively educated women and thought that that was really important to teach other women how to paint so that they can become independent and support themselves and gain knowledge. Um, so we have in this composition, we see we have that kind of classical uh, pyramid or uh, triangular kind of composition between her and her two pupils. She looks at us, one of her pupil kind, kind of looks at us, her other pupil is focused on the painting that she's doing. She has all her painter's tools, her brushes and her palette in her lap. And then what's interesting is we have this kind of V that's made between the canvas and um, the figures and she doesn't show us what she's painting on the canvas, right? That's not the thing that she's stressing as important as part of her identity. She's um, emphasizing her role as an educator as the important part of her identity, an educator and a painter, right? But educator first. But in this V that's created, you can see this um, bust in the background, this, this portrait bust. That's of her father. And it's kind of, um, it's interesting. In uh, earlier self-portraits of male artists, often they'd have a female sculpture of some kind um, in the background standing in as the muse, as the inspiration, which is traditionally a, a woman. A, the muse to in classical um, work is, is always female. So this is her sort of making a little statement sort of subtly at the time that she is the master, she is the artist, and her muse is this male. So it's a kind of a gender role reversal. It's very subtly done, but it was uh, significant and intentional at the time. Okay, and you can see the way that she uses light. We still have this kind of soft, naturalistic look that was popular at the time, but you can see the echoes of uh, tenebrism and the Baroque in here, right? We still have the kind of dark background with the, the very light highlights, particularly on, on the women's faces and on the draping of her gown. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's hop across the channel to England. So this is uh, William Hogarth. Um, so 
he is kind of the pioneer of this very English style that emerges at the time. Um, and he's, he's known for um, a style that kind of celebrates the uh, newly pro prosperous middle class, right? So he's kind of on the same page with natural art. Um, from past lectures, you might remember that many uh, of the, the painters that make a name for themselves in Britain, that we kind of think of as British painters, are actually European painters that went and painted in courts of kings. So um, Holbein, for example, Rubens, um, Ginaleski, her dad particularly, these are, are painters that sort of make their name in Britain, but they aren't actually British, they're European painters. This creates this sort of art historical area where painters of the continent are considered um, by some uh, at the time to be the superior artists to British painters, okay? Uh, Hogarth hated that. <laughs> so he was like, no, 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 um, British painters are great. We have a lot of really talented people here. We're just as talented, if not more talented, than people on the continent. So that was a big thing that he, he talked about and he really advocated for um, kind of being a homegrown British painter. Okay, um, so he, he talks about not being influenced by the continent, which isn't totally true. I mean, when we look at this painting, we can see that he is probably influenced some by the Rococo um, in terms of style and setting, um, but his subject matter is very English and it's, it's very different for the time, okay? So he loved British uh, satirical writing. This was kind of a heyday of British uh, satirical writing. One of the biggest writers in this genre of the time is Henry Fielding. Henry Fielding and Hogarth are friends, they're, they're buddies. Um, so he, Hogarth kind of cast himself in this role as like the guy who takes the idea of satirical writing and translates it into visual narrative painting. Um, so he would often make paintings in a series, um, like a, a series of paintings that are related, um, and not just a series that are sort of loosely related, but particularly a series of um, narrative paintings that go in sequence, which then, right, is almost like, um, it's almost, it's kind of like a comic strip, almost, except these are, you know, paintings. Um, or like the scenes in a play, like each painting is like an act of a play, kind of. Uh, so this painting um, is from the series called Marriage a la Mode, which means, you know, marriage of the, of the time. Uh, and this scene is the breakfast scene. There are six paintings in this series. Um, so in this series, we are looking at the newish marriage of a vice count, and so it's him and his wife, and we're seeing that the marriage is starting to flounder. It's starting to kind of fall apart, even though they haven't been married very long. So in this particular one, the wife is sitting at the table there. She like looks very tired at breakfast. This is because she's been, as you can see from the other scene, she's been up all night playing cards and drinking with her friends while her husband was out on the town philandering with another woman. Okay, so we have her kind of tired, oh, I've been up all night playing cards, da da da. And then we have, um, the husband, the vice count here, who's kind of like leaning back in his chair and looks a little worse for wear himself, their dog is sniffing at something in his pocket that is a um, cap, a, a lace cap of another woman, of the other woman that he was seeing in the night. We have this other figure who's walking out of the scene rolling his eyes. That's their steward, and his hand are all the unpaid bills that the vice count has. The vice count is digging in his pockets, trying, like, like no money, looking for money to pay the bills of the steward, and the steward is just kind of like over it. He has his hand up and is rolling his eyes. Um, so it's this humorous, satirical kind of setup. Um, okay, so we also have the setting of the home, which is quite luxurious. But there are little like kind of snips implying that that they they have kind of bad taste basically. So the most obvious one is if we look in the background, we have this these three paintings which are of like pious saints, and then we have this one where you can see it's covered by this curtain and there's just a foot on a bed sticking out. That would have been an erotic painting, okay? So it wasn't proper at the time for ladies to view erotic paintings, so they'd be 
um, covered with this curtain, but then the, the man of the house, the vice count, when he just had his, his dudes over, could pull the curtain back and show this erotic sexual painting, or it would just be a nude painting of a woman or something. So it's kind of funny that it's put here, um, you know, in succession with these pious saint paintings. So it's, it's implying that they have money, but they maybe don't have great taste. Um, okay. So there's a lot of careful detail here um, that kind of implies these sort of juxtapositions. Um, he also, of these series of paintings that he did, he would produce engravings of the paintings that could then be sold. So he would have the paintings that could be purchased, and then he would also sell many, many copies of the uh, prints from the engravings that became quite, quite popular. They were so popular, actually, that there were um, some people who ripped them off, who would reproduce them without permission um, and try to make money off them and were pretty successful with that. So it's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon. Okay, another uh, British painter of the time that we'll talk about is Thomas Gainsborough. He's quite famous. Um, he's interesting and in that he has these kind of Rococo looking settings and then he combines them with these more naturalistic representations of the figures that he paints. Um, his subject is informally dressed. In Rococo she'd be like in a velvet and silk very um, kind of over-the-top outfit, right? She's seated in um, kind of a rustic setting. It was going to be more rustic. He was going to add um, sheep in, we know from his sketches, but he, he actually died before he finished this canvas. Um, he, it kind of, uh, there are things about it that remind me of Watteau, right? If you look back at the, the Rococo slides and we think about Watteau and the way he painted, um, it's kind of like if you took the Rococo and some elements of Watteau and threw it in a blender, with natural art of the time and you mixed it all up and then poured it in a British mug and served it. So it's he's kind of a combination of a lot of the prominent styles of the time, so he's very interesting to look at. The soft-hued light, the feathery brush strokes also kind of remind me of Watteau, but I think that Gainsborough's are particularly beautiful, so that's why I, I include these details. If you look at the way her hands are holding that translucent material, the way the material kind of loops around her body, and just the way that color is used in this sort of wispy, light way is just extremely lovely. It almost looks like a pastel, right? It looks kind of like a Degas, which comes later. We'll talk about him later. It looks a little bit like pastel work, but it's actually oil paint. Um, so it's just, it's, it's quite lovely. Um, he began as a landscape painter, which you can kind of tell when you see how much detail and work he puts into the background and how expressive his treatment of the landscape is. And then he actually becomes more famous and successful as a portrait artist, because that's a more popular thing of the time. But you, you can kind of see that he has some interest in, uh, landscape by the care he places in the background. Okay. Let's hop across the pond to America and look at some American painters of the time, because um, America is a thing now. Uh, okay, so this is um, Benjamin West. So he's uh, born in 1738 in what is now Pennsylvania and was then kind of the uh, wild west of the colonies, basically. Um, he dies in 1820. Um, so he goes to Europe to study art. So he's interested in art from a young age, but then when he's old enough, he goes to, to Europe to study. Um, he then ends up in England. And it's kind of hilarious to me. He becomes the official court painter of King George III. If you know anything about history, which you probably know at least this, King George III is the King George that we revolted against in the American Revolution. Um, so he's his official court painter, even though he's technically an American and was born in Pennsylvania, and he remains his court painter um, throughout the, the Revolutionary War. He, he stays on as his number one uh, court painter, which is kind of funny. Um, okay, so in this painting, this is uh, the death of General Wolfe. Um, so General Wolfe is this uh, hero, this British hero. He's a young commander, um, and this is another bit of history, these historical paintings, you have to have a little bit of context. So this is after the, um, the Battle of Quebec, which 
as you know, Quebec is in Canada. So this battle was sort of the defeating blow that made Canada um, British, that gave Canada to, the, to Great Britain rather than France. They defeat France. But the young commander, General Wolfe, is mortally wounded in this battle. And so this is him in his last moments as he is dying. Um, so you can tell that uh, West is trained in Europe because you have a lot of things in this composition that, that seem very reminiscent of historical European painting, right? So we have, um, we have this very dramatic lighting, it makes us think a little of tenebrism. We also um, have this very kind of um, logical orderly composition. We have this clump of people, we have this clump of people, we have this clump of people. They're all organized in very geometric ways. So it's all very balanced and very intentionally composed. We have this rich color. One of the things that made this painting um, very popular and helped make um, Benjamin West well known in Britain is his portrayal of a uh, Native American warrior. So this was a new thing for the British. They had never seen this um, kind of figure portrayed in art before, and it made it kind of a fascination, right? Kind of a curiosity almost. Um, so we see this complex composition that reminds us of historical paintings in Europe. He combines um, a traditional kind of hero painting with um, the modern uh, natural art and realism that's popular over the time. Um, he's very influential uh, for that combination. Um, Let's see. If we look at the composition, it kind of, for me, it reminds me of paintings of the martyrdom of saints. So we have this hero in the middle who's been slain and everyone is circling around him, mourning him. So we have this kind of um, parallel of this, the death of this young commander with uh, the death um, and, and martyrdom of saints in, in classical painting in Europe. Okay, this is another American painter. Um, so this is uh, John Singleton Copley. So he is born in Massachusetts. He matures as a painter in the Boston area. Um, he does eventually move to England. This is painted before he moves to England, but he, he doesn't study painting in Europe. He's kind of a through and through American trained painter. Um, his style is noted uh, in, the, in keeping with the natural art ideals of the time, and it's particularly American in its honesty and plainness. Like, it's just very straightforward as a painting, right? Um, this is Paul Revere, so I'm sure you know who Paul Revere is. He's a hero of the American Revolution. This is before he was a hero, so this is when he was a silversmith that was just working in Boston, and John Singleton Copley painted his portrait as a silversmith working on a teapot. So you can see he has his leather engraving pillow there that his hand and the teapot are resting on. His tools are scattered on the table in front of him, which is very polished, so you can see the reflection. Um, but basically, this very down-to-earth kind of character in this painting is um, significant as an American aspect of the natural art style of the time. Okay. This is the last one we're going to talk about. Um, so I want to end with this one because we're going to talk about the influence of the Grand Tour um, in the next lecture. So that's very influential for the next phase when we go into neoclassicism. Um, this is Pompeo Batoni. He's an Italian portrait painter. He's um, in Venice and then he's uh, in Rome. He is known for creating these personalized mementos of the Grand Tour. Um, he's born in Lucca. He trains as a painter in Rome, and he did um, somewhere between 150 and 200 of these paintings of um, mostly English, wealthy Englishmen who were taking this grand tour, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, next time. But it becomes, it's, it's kind of like um, the wealthy trip souvenir of the time. You make this tour all around Europe and you have your portrait made by someone like Pompeo Batoni showing you as this learned traveling 
man. So these are kind of emblematic of the natural art movement in that they're done in that style. They have kind of a nod to the Rococo and that it's um, only wealthy patrons who can afford to do this traveling. And then they also lead into neoclassicism because these, these uh, grand tour trips uh, become a huge lead-in and influence and catalyst to the development of neoclassicism. So these kind of portraits are kind of at the, the crux of all of the movements that happen in the 18th century. So I like to put this one here as we lead into the, the last movement we'll talk about for the 18th century, which is neoclassicism. Um, make sure you take a look at the notes. You do have uh, discussion assignments that are due at the end of the week, and also you have a quiz. So make sure you take note of all these things, and I will talk to you about neoclassicism next.